Today on Monkey Life, Alison responds to a request from the police to rescue a neglected marmoset and brings the youngster back to the park. Not sure if it's sex, don't have a name for it, quite a young and bouncy animal. The Siaman Gibbons have a training session. Give me a hand. Good boy. And pumpkins in the mist for the chimps. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. He's a sweetheart, he is, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> He's lovely. And you are as well. The park provides a home for more than 250 monkeys and apes from 21 different species. An early morning fog has descended on the park, but at Hanania's enclosure, the gloom is about to lift. The chimps are getting a colourful breakfast, and these bright eye-catching pumpkins stand out whatever the weather. Wendy from the primate care team has plenty of the seasonal treats for the 19 chimps who make up this group. She's distributing the bright orange vegetable all around the enclosure to give everyone an opportunity to grab their share. Watch your head. <laughs> yes! As ever, there's lots of noisy enthusiasm, led by Hananya, who initially ignores the pumpkins for his morning display. His second-in-command, Simon, joins in the antics, but in his excitement, misplaces his pumpkin. Cherry may have her breakfast in hand, but as usual, she's multitasking. She's got more than a handful with Thelma on board. Hananya uses the hands-free approach, but is torn between tucking into his prize and hooting his excitement to the group. Vocalizations are really important in chimp society and Hanania's letting the others know there's a treat on offer. But not all the chimps have got a taste for pumpkin. Jess isn't impressed. Tootie is carving into her pumpkin, but doesn't like the skin. Chimps, like people, have their food preferences. Cherry has temporarily deserted her own little pumpkin, and is heading to the top of the climbing frame to eat in peace. Not that Thelma's bothered, she's getting stuck in, despite the size of the prize. Hananya's obviously got a liking for pumpkin. He's devoured the whole of his, seeds and all, and is off for seconds. Simon still hasn't grasped how to look after his. Another bit of bravado, this time towards high-ranking female Johnny, and he loses out as she steals his breakfast. The pumpkins have been a hit. High-ranking Peggy heads off into the mist to eat in peace and quiet while Valerie has already thoroughly enjoyed hers and is licking her fingers. And post-pumpkin feast, there's a hug for Thelma from Auntie Evelyn, who's always happy to share with the youngster, as Patricia wraps up for a little nap. As the fog begins to lift over at the Marmoset complex, the primate care staff are preparing one of the bedrooms for an unexpected new arrival. Alison is on her way back to the park from North London with another common marmoset. She's been called in by the Metropolitan Police following an investigation at a property. They requested her help after a tip-off there was a primate on the premises who would need immediate aid. 
The marmoset was found in a tiny cage in an unheated flat in poor condition and without the correct food. So now with the team standing by, both Alison and the tiny monkey are arriving back at the park. So normally when we get a new marmoset in, um, we obviously have to get a room ready for them. Um, we have to branch out. Um, this morning when Alison um, saw the marmoset for the first time, she let us know that her mobility is pretty good, so we haven't had to put in extra branches um, more than we would normally do. But we've just got ready a nice tasty dinner for them, um, some porridge, which is what we normally give our marmosets for breakfast, and some gum as well. So there's lots of different food items in there for her to, to see what she fancies, and, and hopefully she'll eat well when she arrives. The primate care team are anxious to get a good look at their new arrival so that they can settle her in as soon as possible. Hi, little girl. You are going to be a little girl. And look at the little hands. Like, everything looks juvenile to me. The white tufts coming through on her ears mean the newbie is probably a year old or younger. For now, they're assuming it's a female. But with marmosets, it's hard to know for certain until they're examined. <laughs> My gut tells me it's a little girl. I don't know because I've not had yeah. a good exam. The team will do all they can to get her fit and healthy, but no one is sure if she'll have a long-term future at the park. At the moment, she's in our custody yes. for professional care. Okay. But she is now part of a legal battle. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there, there yeah. could be an issue. I, I don't think, based upon the conditions which she was kept in, I can't see that that's, that she would go back. Mm -hmm. I, I, but you never know. No. Ready? The young adolescent marmoset is going to spend the first night alone in one of the bedrooms at the park's hospital. The team want to assess the youngster and give it time and space to adjust to new surroundings before being confronted by all the other residents in the bedrooms at the marmoset complex. At this point in time, we've got what I know to be a common marmoset, not sure of its sex, don't have a name for it, and we know that he or she weighs 170 grams at this point, so quite a young and bouncy animal. I mean, the, the other thing that was very clear is that in the car on the way back from London to Dorset, he or she was just playing wildly inside of the box, and it was really very sweet. So very young, adolescent -y type behavior. I'm, I'm just gonna start calling it her because I'm thinking it probably is a her. God, I just don't know yet, but animals this age, common marmosets this age, aren't always straightforward to sex, so we'll have to wait and see. Ideally, the young marmoset will find companionship with one of the many marmosets already at the park. But before then, the team will have to take faecal samples to check for parasites and to make sure he or she is healthy enough to meet and interact with new friends. The key to happiness for all the primates at Monkey World, from the recently rescued to the old timers, is companionship of their own kind. It's something the park work really hard at getting right, but sometimes it's just effortless. Sam and Sasak are a pair of devoted Siaman gibbons. They're a male-female pair who've been together since 2011, after Sam tragically lost his son, Onion, and before that, his previous mate, Sage. Sasak arrived from Dublin Zoo, and the pair have been inseparable ever since. Gibbons generally pair up for life, and the devoted couple spend much of their days grooming and foraging together in the wonderful tree-filled enclosure. Their mutual devotion is displayed loudly every morning as they sing their beautiful start-of-the-day duet. Simon Gibbons have large throat sacs, allowing them to throw their voices several miles through the tree canopy, announcing to everyone, this is their territory and they're a strong and united couple. Today, primate carekeeper Kat is giving the pair one of their regular training sessions. Hey, guys. Known as operant conditioning. Hi, guys. The training method teaches the animals to present certain parts of their body to Kat for inspection in return for a reward. Give me a hand. Good boy. Good girl. 
these training sessions are actually really good because they enjoy the interaction with their, their primate care staff, um, but obviously they do really enjoy getting the treats as well, and it helps us to build our relationships and trust with them as well. The operant conditioning has huge benefits for, for many different reasons, but the number one major benefit is that we can actually get the animals to come over, show us different parts of their body, we can get a really good look at them, and that means we can check for different issues with their health, with their body condition, injuries, all sorts of things like that. Um, often we can actually then even further that, we can treat it with the animal cooperating and allowing us to do that because it's part of their routine. When the guys get really unwell, we might want to give them antibiotics or something like that. So by letting them come over and give us that, it saves a lot of stress of having to get a dart gun and things like that to use. This technique is crucial to the welfare of all the primates in the park, primarily for health reasons. It allows staff to constantly monitor the primates and Kat has already seen the results. Boy, good lad. Sam actually currently has two um, potential issues with his teeth, and I, by him showing me his mouth every day, I can really keep a good close eye on that. Um, so right now, his upper left canine, um, it was a little bit discoloured, and he actually snapped it. Potentially, that could be an incredibly painful thing, um, but it doesn't seem to be bothering him right now, and I'm not seeing any inflammation or redness or anything in the gums, and he's eating really well with it and he also has a very discoloured lower incisor as well. And by regularly mean, you know, looking at these things, I can keep an eye on it, and if it gets worse, I can flag that up and get the dentist in to sort it out for us. The pair seem to be enjoying good health, and Kat is delighted that, after seven years, their bond is as strong as ever. They're really happy, really relaxed together. They're never really any trouble, so um, they're both stars to us, really. It's been a few days since the big woolly monkey move, and so far it's a success. The park now has three happy groups living in three separate houses. But there's one final piece of the puzzle still to complete, involving little Cosmo. At only six months old, he's now the youngest member of Lavar's newly formed group. Cosmo has been hand-reared by Alison and the team ever since Mum Isla rejected him at birth. Gradually, Cosmo has been introduced to all the group, and he's getting on with them really well. So much so, he's now sleeping with them overnight. During the day, he's been left in one of the bedrooms, all decked out with toys for him to grab and climb, but still safe enough to ensure he can't hurt himself if he falls. But his next big step is to summon up the courage to graduate from his bedroom to the main playroom. It's a far bigger and more daunting environment. We've had to deck it out with a load more equipment in there, so there's lots more cargo nets up in there, um, loads more dog toys and hosing, climbing equipment for him to get around easily. We don't want him to get stuck and stranded anywhere on his own. Um, and alongside that, we've deep littered the floor, so there's a big spongy layer of straw and wood wool, so that if he was to have a fall, it would be cushioned for him as well. hand and woolly monkeys are always at a disadvantage when it comes to tackling new challenges. He is still really small and quite fragile, so we've had to put in all this extra equipment just because he doesn't have a mum to carry him around, so we don't want him to get stuck anywhere and not be able to get down from a particular position. We want to make sure that there's either something to catch his fall or obviously he's going to be safe. They needn't have worried. Lavar leads the group out and a confident Cosmo doesn't waste any time following him. There are a lot of youngsters in the group to show Cosmo the ropes and for him to interact with. They include Bueno Jr., another young male who was hand-reared at the park, and two-year-old Carlos, the son of Chippy and Yurima. But perhaps the two he's forged the closest relationships with so far are two-year-old Olivia and her mum, Zingu. And then there's the dominant male of the group, Levar who's really experienced when it comes to bringing up kids, both his own and babies who've been hand-reared. He's wonderful at bringing them into the group and making sure they're safe and happy, often keeping a watchful eye. The big playroom doesn't seem to phase Cosmo. 
It's just another rung on the ladder in his development as a growing woolly monkey. Every day is kind of a new challenge for Cosmo at the moment. You know, there'll be areas of the house which he hasn't discovered as of yet. Um, but the next big milestone for him is going to be going and exploring the outside world. So we've got big long tunnel systems connected to this house. And then he's got two big outside enclosures to start exploring. So really exciting when he gets to that point. And hopefully, once he discovers the outside world, he's going to have loads of fun out there as well. Over at the Stumpy House, the ugly monkeys, as they're affectionately known, are getting a special low-calorie treat in the form of rawhide bones, good for keeping them busy and helping to clean their teeth. There are ten members in this group led by leader Sam. He, like six others, came to Monkey World from medical laboratories in Britain. But the three newer members are conspicuous by their absence, preferring to spend most of their time in the large outdoor enclosure. Female Flo arrived from a rescue centre in Munich three years ago, and the group's newest additions, Toto and Freddy, have been here almost a year. They were brought to the park from a rescue centre in Belgium, but very little is known about their previous lives. One thing's for sure, the two couldn't be more different. So Fred seems to be a much more kind of effective stumpy. Like, he, he knows what he's doing. He's a good social animal. He understands when to sort of go up and say hello to people and when to sort of back off and give a bit of space. Um, in comparison, Toto has zero social skills. You know, he looks magnificent. There's not a lot going on inside that fabulous head, though. So it's actually really handy that those guys have formed an alliance because Freddy's kind of... He seems sympathetic that Toto is a bit odd um, and they spend a lot of time together, kind of, you know, quality man time sitting and pondering the universe together on a platform. Yeah, good solid ally for Toto. What Toto may lack in stumpy etiquette, he more than makes up for in looks. Toto is a magnificent creature, you know, all of that ridiculous hair, particularly when he sort of gives himself a shake and you've got sort of golden locks flying everywhere. Um, it's no wonder that a couple of the low-ranking females are eyeing him up. You know, he's a very sexy boy, very beautiful. Um, so, yes, absolutely magnificent to look at. Quite often hear him compared to a lion with his sort of great long mane. Um, so, yeah, very distinctive amongst our guys who are all a little, you know, battered and a bit sort of hair loss and, and things like that. So, yeah, very distinctive boy. Freddy has struck up a very close relationship with Flo, who, until the boys arrived, was a bit of an outsider. She's now a lot more confident around the rest of the group, although it's Freddy she seeks out for grooming sessions. Bringing the group together has been a slow but steady process. The laboratory stumpies have been together for years, and accepting new members into their midst hasn't come naturally. But other than the initial introductions, there's been very little aggression. All in all, the group seem to have accepted each other and things are heading in the right direction. You know, a lot of these guys are quite old. They're kind of past the fighting stage. They don't want to be, you know, at each other's throats or anything. Um, so everyone's kind of chilled out a lot and we're just hopeful, you know, every little step we see that's sort of a nice behaviour, like Fred and Flo grooming or Maureen coming out and presenting to Toto because she thinks he's a bit sexy. You know, that kind of stuff, when we see that, it gives us hope that these guys are going to settle in and become really sort of good, good friends and, and a nice tight group. At the Capuchin Complex, Franco's group are about to get a seasonal treat. Primate carekeeper Toby has roasted some sweet chestnuts. And, as usual, when there's food on offer, the Capuchins can hardly contain their excitement. They're still warm. We've, we've sort of had, had them cooked up. Um, it'd just be something different for them. They, they've had them sort of cold before, but the, having them warm um, will hopefully give them something a bit different and sort of the different sensation of the warm food as well. And it's sort of quite a cold day, so it'd be quite a nice treat for them. Capuchins are extremely clever. They eat nuts in the wild and will use rocks to crack open the hard shells. These chestnuts, however, have a softer skin, and with their large canine teeth and powerful bite, the capuchins should make light work of them. 
they've all come running over. Everyone's waiting nicely and fairly calm for Franco's group. So yeah, I think hopefully they will will enjoy this. They get very excited when they get nuts, and it's sort of a very noisy but a very good form of enrichment for them. It's a rush to find the nuts, with leader Franco making sure he gets more than his fair share. In fact, all the high rankers in this group are getting first pickings. Fabian is eating his up high, while the top females, like Mary, easily shelling her chestnut, and Lucy are also tucking in. But lower rankers, such as Digit and Emily, are hovering on the periphery, anxiously awaiting their turn. The majority of the capuchins who found a chestnut are making short work of shelling them. William shows exactly what sharp teeth and a powerful bite can do. The capuchins are, are very, very lively. They, you, you very rarely see our guys resting, particularly this group. This is our, our youngest group. Most of them sort of our age between sort of 11 and 16 now. Um, so they're, they're very lively. They're always on the go. They, they like to be out and about foraging, looking around for food. And we try and keep them busy with various scatters and by sort of finding different and new ways to present their food to them. All the capuchins have enjoyed the warm seasonal treat, and some, like mid-ranker Frida, are still making the most of it. They seem to have most definitely enjoyed it. There's yeah, lots of happy sounds, and everybody's managed to get some. Once sort of Franco had gathered his horde and disappeared, and the dominant females had all gone away, then the lower ranking animals like Felipe and Elvira and Emily have all come over, and they're finding all the sort of leftover ones. So everyone's had a really good sort of amount of chestnuts. Next time on Monkey Life. Orangutan Oshin is under the weather and gets a little TLC from Jeremy. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Come on. And treats for the woolies after their big house move. 